Okay. <clears throat> Let's play. All right? Homo ludens, man as the player. Noblest game, philosophy. Well, this is a very interesting idea. It's the doorway into philosophy. That's what it is. It's the doorway. Because not only is it central to the whole development of Platonic philosophy, but it creates the greatest mystery. Two things, right? It creates a mystery. A profound mystery. And it admits of levels of intensity and with it astonishment. H, astonishment. Gosh, I don't need a T. We could really call it an astonishment and a wonder. And if I can make this clear, then we can understand how to get into philosophy. Now, language shapes vision. It shapes it for seeing. It's rather curious what language does, right? It can prepare you for seeing with the mind. So it brings to birth what was previously only in shadows. Oh. To that degree, the, even the slightest perception of beauty is a promise of something greater. Well, you can look at all kinds of things from mountains to seas, none of them have implicit in the experience of those things the promise that there's something greater. It's really curious why that is. No matter what level of beauty a person has experienced, it is authentic to the degree that one perceives in it the possibility of something beyond it more profound. That's what I call the promise. That's the promise. Now, let's talk about something very interesting, the mystery of it. If the universe is mechanical, <clears throat> if it's a closed system, if it's all mechanical, if we live in a mechanical, random universe, divorced of any intrinsic meaning, then the existence of beauty is a mystery because there's no place in the universe, in the physical universe, for beauty. It's a be phenomenal. It shouldn't be there. If we've understood the entire universe, everything about it from the lowest to the highest, from the micro to the macrocosm all the way, and if we can't get in touch with this, we've, we haven't touched it at all. That's, the, that's, that's why it's a doorway. Now, the reason it's a doorway into philosophy is because it's totally unnecessary. It's, beauty is totally unnecessary in a mechanical and random structured universe. There's just absolutely no need for it. If you live in a world that's nihilistic, right, 
If nihilism, relativism, relativism is afloat, if, if you're into this meaningless, empty existence where ugliness is broadcast as the highest aesthetic value as it is today, this clearly shows that it's a lie. It's all, it's a lie. A friend of mine who's a musician, that is someone I know, I'm not sure he's a friend, told me that the reason he turns the volume up, he's one of these people with four other people and the drums blast through the neighborhood. He said, the reason I turn the volume all the way up is to keep guys like you from talking. We don't like competition. So we'll put the volume so loud that you can't hear the other person, then we know our music is a success. See, previously people used to try to present something so beautiful that the astonishment of being in its presence would subdue this, any competing desire to allow you to be bathed in some way in it, to participate in it, and naturally it would gain your attention. So it's a different principle. His was a different principle. Now, I think in our world, which is basically this relativistic, reductionist, everything is reduced to something less than itself, reductionism, right? And if you're not familiar with this term, it takes the form of it's nothing but If you reduce something profound to, well, it's nothing but, let's do it. This language here is nothing but just words thrown together. And words are nothing but sounds uttered in the air, and therefore it's nothing other than just certain curious wavelengths bouncing from one person to the other through the medium of air. Right. Rembrandt is just a dollar and eighty-five cents worth of paints, maybe five dollars for the canvas. That's all it is. See, it's nothing but. Right. Well, faced with this, as I certainly was once, I took a position against this long ago. I can say that now. And I knew that so long as there was this thing called beauty, that somewhere there was and had to be meaning. Somewhere, because it was ridiculous for it to exist in the universe of mechanical forces. Therefore, beauty, the very possibility of music, of, of beauty, indicated very clearly to me and other people like myself that there must be somewhere something intrinsically meaningful or there wouldn't be any beauty at all. And so many of the people I knew right, rejected the idea of beauty except as pleasure. And therefore the thing that kept alive this quest for meaning as it must in every age is experience of beauty. And therefore, what I think is most important to begin in the study of philosophy, perhaps, is Brahms' piano concertos. Mm -hmm. Right, all right, Brahms' piano concertos. To be exposed to the very best music, that's all. Very best. To go, to go, not to hear it on some machine, but to go in the presence of it, you see. Don't listen to it. Don't build up a record collection. Go. Be in the presence of it. Right? Because everything else is an echo. Beauty requires the presence. You have to be there. You have to be in its presence. Because that allows, in some strange way, the spirit of man to emerge and join it. And that sense of the presence and joining in it is nothing other than the Platonic idea of participation. 
Now look here. Participation is a curious word. See, it has the word part in it, and that's not, that's the wrong word for it. See, part, taking a part of something, that's, that's the wrong thing. Because the things you participate in the Platonic universe, you gain as a possession. It's a possession, it's not a participation, but I'll let that language go for a while. Now, to be in the presence, therefore, of beauty requires, therefore, Right, to be in its presence and therefore to, to be present at things that are the greatest, right? Especially Brahms' piano concertos, Beethoven's piano concerto, right? Great works of art. You have to be there. You have to get off your bottom and go. And never look at a good photograph or listen to a good record if you can help it. That's an echo. You have to give to the artist the opportunity, the opportunity to communicate beauty to you, see, to you. Not into a tape recorder, not into any kind of instrument for later use, but the artist needs you to be present so he can have your presence and through that presence participate in what it is that he is doing. Now, I just put a couple of ideas here on the board. You see, what is interesting about beauty is, and everybody knows this, everybody knows this, no degrees are required. <clears throat> no degrees are required. Everybody can play. Everybody can play, no exceptions, but there's a price. A psychic price. You have to be willing, you have to be willing to go through an initiation of discovery. It requires an initiation. You have to go through a period of initiation. And what I mean by initiation is the careful respect for something that you only have an intimation that it is really beautiful. But by the continued reflection and application, you gain, and this is what's most important about this concept of interpretation, pardon me, of uh, initiation, is that it then becomes clear that they are levels open to you. And these levels that are open to you in the experience of beauty, you realize have nothing, nothing at all to do with formal knowledge. Not that it doesn't, may not enhance it to some degree, but it has nothing to do with formal education. It has nothing to do with memory. It's not totally a memory, though memory is very important for it, because to be able to anticipate it and proceed with it <clears throat> is obviously an important element. What is important, however, is that you recognize that you yourself have to be in a certain state to proceed more deeply. Right. That you yourself, see, that's the price. Not everybody can pay the price. You have to prepare. You have to psychically, whatever that means, Right? Psychically, whatever that means, solely, right through the soul, through the mind. You have to be in such a position where you can receive a sense of kind of a quiet participation, nearly an enter into a silence, right? Enter a kind of a silence, receptive silence. Because to that degree, then, you can allow, in that state, an anticipation of something good. And I'll change that, an anticipation of something good, 
to an anticipation of goodness. Now, I'm going to use that word quite a bit in a short while. So therefore, you recognize that at first you may find these different kinds of things a little strange, though you may have, it must have an intimation of its beauty. And then by continual application to it, reflection on it, you then discover that you can get into it more profoundly. The more you're familiar with it, the more you become attuned to it, participate in it. And then it requires from you a certain psychic state of mind where you have to be receptive and open to something that intrinsically has a goodness about it. Not because it's going to give you something or change you in some physical way, but the experience itself has a kind of goodness because the goodness it possesses is an indication and a acceptance that there is in the very nature of our reality something called beauty and in that recognition you know that you're living in and participating in a meaningful universe an intelligible universe because to the degree that beauty increases in its depth for the experiencer to that very degree to that very degree <clears throat> you can say that it becomes intelligible now that's a strange word so we have two key strange words we're going to play with right goodness and intelligible especially in the higher reaches of such experiences as beauty well then look here see whether this is true you see you can evolve a language to reflect together so long as you're with people who are willing to talk about beauty. A natural language emerges. That language becomes the very language to explore philosophy. That's why it's important. Let's try it, see? Is it not true that when you experience anything that you regard as beautiful, and reflect, come on, reflect. Are you not delighted when you see that beauty? Does it awaken in you signs of kinship? Like there's something akin to whatever it is that's being experienced that you're drawn to because it shows signs of kinship to yourself. Uh-oh, that's dangerous. That means the continued exposure to beauty has to awaken in you a challenge to challenge to understand yourself more profoundly. That's it. Because in that experience of beauty, there is that sense of kinship that awakens the very idea, right? that there's something more profound going on. That's the promise. And in every experience of beauty, do you not have this effect? Now let's try it, all right? Wherever you experience the beauty, where it is, external, internal, doesn't make any difference wherever it is, is there not a sense in which you want to, you want to draw it into yourself, right? Take it on as your own. Right, take it on. Right. Quiet the breath. Quiet everything else. Let nothing else interfere so that you can in some way take it in. Take it in is a curious word. I take it in. But there's no in, right, to which you can take it, of course. But it's, to take it in means, in the sense, to allow its presence. Right. To allow its presence without anything else competing with it, either from yourself or anything else. So it's in that sense, you see, you take it into yourself, right? It takes it, right? It takes it into itself. Hey, equally, you could say that beauty takes, takes it into itself. It works both ways. Would you not agree any experience of beauty to the degree that you allow it, say, under such conditions? It stirs, it has a power. It stirs a new awareness 
of whence and what it is. Right. What it is? What is it that has this effect? Has no credit cards. Right. Has no degrees. Can't buy it or sell it or swap it. It's there to be participated in. Can't be manipulated. It's the greatest thing in the world, right? <laughs> no one can manipulate it. <laughs> That's astonishing. Right? They can't make a McDonald's out of it. Isn't that comforting? Yes. See, therefore it has some intrinsic integrity beyond anybody passing it this way or that way, using it or abusing it, charging it or anything else. Therefore, seeing, right? Seeing of this sort right? necessarily is a joy. Has to be joyous. We all know that, right? And a wonder. But more than that, it has this curious effect. There's also a sense of distress. And the distress is quite important for the experience of beauty. Because it may awaken several fears. And one of them is, Am I strong enough to endure it? Now, I'm going to change one word. Not only am I strong enough to do it, because that has nothing to do with strength, am I good enough to endure it? Will I allow it, permit it, Will I give it room? All of that is language such as, can I drop my resistances? Can I let it drop? Can I risk dropping everything and letting it be? Well, if you let it be, then you then can be. They go together. Curious enough, they go together. Well, if they go together, see, if they go together, then that means, see, that they are signs in an experience of beauty of a fundamental kinship with our souls. Ah, then, look here. The kinship, the sense of kinship, opens. Right. The sense of kinship can can open oneself. To the profound. Now look here, what I like about this is that to the degree that anything at all intrudes itself, to the degree that anything at all intrudes itself, that tightens, right? tightens, constricts, reduces, compromises this experience. It is by its very nature alien to man. It is alien. And what it is that's most alien to man that compromises this very experience are Curiously enough, are the masks, the protective masks we wear. Therefore, as the experience of beauty intensifies with degrees of profundity and enters into what can be called intelligible, 
there has to be correspondingly a dissolution of the masks we wear, or of the ego as it is sometimes called. But I'm talking about masks that are not like what is called egos, but any sense of restriction, physically and psychically. Any tension, any sense of restriction, even in the face, any tightness, constriction anywhere, can, can inhibit the introduction into this kind of world. Well, if there is then a kinship that we experience in beauty, and it opens itself up to ourselves, then we can say, again, that we encounter a way of being in which being itself And being itself, um, so, yeah, discloses itself. Now, what is interesting about this disclosure? It's a kind of a, it's a disclosure, a participation, allowance, a willingness is that it isn't that the person at that time identifies with it in terms of anything at all about themselves other than their most inmost being itself. most, see? Essential. If that's the case, then that kinship with beauty, right? This kinship that beauty right, unfolds right, must be itself be akin to being itself. That is the nature of reality. Being is a fancy word for the nature of reality. For what is, is the nature of ultimate reality. Now when I say ultimate reality, it just means Right. Just means that all the veils have dropped from the viewer, that's all. It doesn't change. Right. The series of veils that we have, one by one they drop, and therefore it's ultimately the last mask that drops, and that's reality. Well, we remember now, we have to tie in why we can say that not only is it gives an insight into the nature of being or reality, but it's also intelligible and is of its nature a goodness. We haven't come close to looking at that yet. Well. When this experience of the nature of reality and in it one encounters a kinship with oneself, 
then one knows that within it there is something about the nature of reality and oneself. One is not separated from it. That means that man is part and parcel of a greater reality and therefore his sense of alienation from a meaningful universe is absurd. In the highest experiences of beauty, you are part and parcel of reality as a living reality. Now, why the word living? Right, now we're saying it's a living reality. In this experience of beauty, one recognizes therefore a fundamental reality. And at that point, since it's akin to oneself, there's one thing we know about ourselves in a very curious way is that there's a certain vitality to us all, right? There's a certain liveness to ourselves. Well, this reality disclosed in beauty is not any different than the core of our own being, which is itself a vitality. When one grasps in that experience, not even grasping in the experience, when one recognizes that the core of one's being is, is unfolded as an ultimate reality of a vitality, one comes to an, what we call here an astonishment. And what's the astonishment all about? What is the astonishment about? Well, everybody has had insights. We all have insights. We make all kinds of studies of mathematics and literature and language. We have insights, and some people pursue them methodically. In this experience, one recognizes that this is itself pure insight. Pure insight. That is to say, there is an openness right, to the mind itself. That radiates itself. And therefore, the very nature of reality is intelligible. Now, we have something curious here, and I'd like to see if we can explore it a bit. All right, there's this idea of ultimate reality as being composed of what is ultimately let's say, being, right? the nature of what is. as seen in its highest possible vision. And we're now saying not only is it, can we use the word being for it, but it has a vitality. And one recognizes that that is the very source of one's own vitality because that's what one encounters. And then we said it engages intelligibly. There's an intelligibility about it. But you see, as we are astonished by it and turn upon it, we recognize at the same time that <clears throat> its vitality, its vitality and the very nature of its being is doing nothing other than a continuous pure insight. It is mind itself in its highest expression, seeing itself. Therefore, the intelligible itself, the intelligible itself can be said to be turning itself on being, which is not without its vitality, for its vitality is direction and has a direction or a vitality, is intelligible. Wow, what does that mean? That means <clears throat> that these are not separate things, they are hyphenated, one turning in upon the other. 
And to experience that directly is pure beauty. All right, let's do that again. All right. To experience that, to experience that is nothing other than to say beauty itself. You can recognize in that experience that it's akin to the self. You can recognize immediately that the vitality is life itself. You recognize yeah, that this is not alien from mind. For in the highest level of mind as intelligibility, it is not a dumb thing. See, it's not a dumb thing that's encountered because beauty necessarily must have and presupposes an intelligibility, order, pattern, right? concordance, right? especially concordance balance, right? uh, we can turn it upon it and say it also has such wonderful things as a certain reciproci uh, reciproci reciprocity of values. It has balance, it has um, symmetry, levels of symmetry. <clears throat> All of these words are nothing other than images that say about the thing we're talking about that it is intelligible. that behind it there is some great intelligibility, which some modern theorists might call a uh, attractor, a strange attractor. And we're saying that strange attractor is beauty. <clears throat> now, why should anybody say that's good, that there in some way is related to goodness? Is it just by inference we can say that? What shall we say about it? Huh? Well, let's try it again. You see, Philosophy someone could come back and say it's very nice that we live in an intelligible universe and it has great beauty and all of those things. But unless it's fundamentally good, unless the universe is itself good, then the beauty experienced is only ornamental. No matter how profound you paint it, unless it's good, shares in something intrinsically good. It's ornamental and secondary, not an essential aspect of the nature of reality. And therefore, we can say that people who engage in these kinds of reflections might be motivated by an interest in aesthetics. Of the, and they're probably the weaker kind of people, since they can't face a reality that is not good or is at least indifferent to man. Therefore, these two ideas have to be linked together. And so, stop and you say to yourself, are there any kinds of things that we would all agree to where you might say that there is some goodness about that, about this? Hmm. Now look here, health. Huh? Say there's health, now there's something about health. All right, that reaches a certain level of perfection that allows, that allows us then to engage in things higher than health itself. That it's the condition for us, it's the condition for man to then ignore his physical body with impunity and pursue higher goals. So therefore, health is the condition for man's journey. Now look, there are other things besides health that might be considered to be 
of this kind. Now, how about intelligence? Do you say there's anything about intelligence that's interesting for man? I'm using the same logic. Would you say, well, intelligence uh, is important because in the same way it allows for, it's the condition for, for a man to pursue his higher journeys. Because with it, we then are assisted in a variety of ways so that we can most knowledgeably and knowingly pursue and achieve our goals. Okay. What other kinds of things would you say might be classed in the category of having some good? Let's see, some good. Not good itself, but some goodness about it. Would you not agree, all right, that uh, uh, it's important to have uh, a certain kind of harmonious relation with nature, right? not to exploit it and destroy it and bring it into some kind of chaos, but a harmonious regard for and participation in nature. And two, nature. Do you agree with that? Now, is, by the way, would that follow the same thing? Would that then be the condition for a man to pursue more meaningful journeys? Because then there's a substance he's, he's uh, necessary, it's required for his life, and therefore he doesn't have to be in a conflicting situation in conflict with nature. So that if these kinds of things can be just for the moment regarded as goodnesses, would you agree all of these things depend upon one thing to really be called good? And that is, since they prepare man for a condition, for man's journey, every one of them, then it's only, it's only can be said to have some sense of goodness about it to the degree that it can awaken us for a journey not to goodness but to the good itself. And if it doesn't do that, then it has a peripheral value. For health isn't good in itself. Adolf Hitler, people like himself, can be in good health. He can have vast intelligence. They're not good in itself. It allows for a condition. What kind of condition? Maximum, ideal condition for man to pursue his own quest, his own journey. And now we are saying that these things can only can be said to have a certain goodness about them to the degree that man accepts that challenge for that kind of a quest or that kind of a journey, which culminates in, in some way, the good. Well, each of these clearly are an excellence But all of these excellences are only the conditions that allow man to continue on a quest. That is to say, just because you have everything ideal, if you leave them as ideal, that's very nice, but if you can use those things that are ideal for a higher purpose and a higher goal, then you're using them for the highest purpose available. And what's the highest purpose that's available? Highest purpose is the quest for the good. Now, That's a rather curious thing, because what it means, though, from what we're saying, is that beauty itself, the experience of beauty itself, and the way in which we've described it, awakens in man a very curious thing. Very curious. And the more profound the experience, the more it op awakens it. And that is a distress, a crisis. Now, not all, not all people experience the crisis or the distress. 
But it's easy to bring them to that crisis if they are open to these types of experiences. By putting forward a few simple questions, First one is, should there be a difference between good and goodness? Should there be a difference between good and goodness? Why, sure, you would say. The idea of ness at the end of any word means equality, equality of the thing, redness, the quality of red. Right? Goodness, quality. Therefore, <clears throat> the difference between the two must be that the good must be in itself good and have no other qualities other than itself. Matter of fact, have no qualities other than itself, but itself can't be a quality. A quality is something that can be participated by something else and that they can therefore share in it and be called by it, the same way as red. I don't mean anything other than taking the example of red. If you want to say that red is, is a quality, then there should be something that you can do with this curious thing called red. And that is, you can make things have redness about them, right? The quality of red presupposes there must be something called red. Just red by itself. So therefore, this whole idea of a quality is captured by this ness word. Therefore, if there is such a thing as the good, it cannot itself have any other quality, cannot have any qualities, it must be just itself good. Ah, now wait a minute. <clears throat> What does that allow us to say? That's the basis of this crisis. That's the basis of the crisis and the distress. Let's see if we can manage it. Here we go. If someone now were to come forward to us and say, by the way, I am in this highest of all quests and I seek such things as enlightenment, as it's sometimes called, or wisdom, <clears throat> and we might say, well, <clears throat> please let us know when you've gotten it so you can come back and talk to us. And let's say they're the right kind of person and they go off and they are successful and they come back and they say to us, got it. And we were then to say to them, really? And they would undoubtedly say, of course. And we'd say, by the way, what is it? What is it that you found? And suppose they were to say, well, it is beauty. <clears throat> and if we were to say, what kind of beauty? And they would say, why, good heavens. It's that fantastic thing. And suppose they use language such as we used a moment ago. What would they say if we were to say to them, you know, you may be right about this wisdom and enlightenment, but I just wonder whether or not it fits what we were talking about. And if they were to not get upset but ask us what we mean, suppose they were to then go on and say, well, let me repeat because you probably didn't hear. And they'd come back and say, Yes, I did experience the most profoundness of beauty. It was just the way you described it. Now, what do you find that you can ask about it? And again, I suppose you were to go back and say, now, wait a minute. <clears throat> just want to know one thing again. You are talking about something that is, are you not? And you are describing it in a set of terms, are you not? I mean, it is beautiful. It is and has a vitality and intelligibility. I mean, it, you are experiencing mind, are you not? I mean, there is something there that you're describing that has these qualities. And they say, yeah, yeah. yeah. I say, well, then you'd agree, would you not, that you haven't reached that which has no qualities. And therefore, there is something about this experience that is extremely profound and is very important to have, but it can't be the good. And therefore, our friend then, 
may say, why, thank you very much. I nearly fell into the delusion of thinking I had reached something profound indeed beyond all other things. And now I realize he might say to go on the quest of the good itself. And of course, we'd pat him on the head, right? Offer him a cup of coffee and insist, therefore, that his success, you know, uh, the best for his success. And uh, ask him again, by the way, when you do come back and have it, please come by and talk to us because we would enjoy the discussion. For some people to see this is very distressing because it is an ultimate experience. By that, I mean you can rank experiences and such an experience may in fact be the ultimate. But for the good itself, let's take a look at something curious about it. In order to talk about it, I'm going to avoid that and go back to beauty and then go back to the good itself. All right, here we go. Suppose this friend of ours on reflection were to come back and say, <clears throat> but it's still the highest experience. We'd say, oh yes, yeah, 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 mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, highest experience. Suppose he would come back and say, not only is it the highest experience, but I see very clearly in that experience that um, there, it has no boundaries. No boundaries. No boundary to it. Uh, in that sense, limitless. In that highest experience of beauty into the very nature of reality, so that's limitless, no boundaries. And that's its real, that's what it really is. I suppose we say, yes, 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 you're quite right, quite right. Yeah, it is limitless. Oh, but by the way, it is, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Well, then, to that degree, it also has a limit. Therefore, the two terms which can really be used to describe the sense of beauty itself is the limit and the limitless. Right. That is to say, unlimitedness, no limit, no limit, no boundary, right? infinite, infinite as a vitality and power, etc. Therefore, it still is, I mean, it is. Therefore, this experience has two major categories on reflection and only discovered on reflection that you have to also say that fundamentally it is composed of limit and the unlimited. And therefore, in respect to that experience, it also admits of degrees. <clears throat> in this ultimate experience, What's most curious beyond words is while it is ultimate, it can be perceived, can be participated, can be lengthened, can be absorbed into it to greater depths or heights. More profound, if you like, the one more lofty with the other, whichever way you like in your language, right? So let's say it's both lofty and profound. Therefore, it admits of degrees. And to the degree that it admits to degrees, to that very degree, it admits of your own, your own separation, separation from all, from masks, tensions, and all things alien to man's basic nature. And therefore, to the degree then that you participate in this, to this degree, you gain greater and greater awareness of what you yourself are, and that's disclosed as a fundamental goodness, then that will give you the courage to go on and try to find good heavens. 
where in heaven's name can this idea of limit and unlimitedness come from? What is its source? What is its origin? How is that related to the good? The, the most interesting thing about the good is that it has no qualities. You can attribute nothing to it. In the final analysis, you might call it the one or the good, insofar as they are identical. but it's the kind of term in all its purity that you finally have to even eliminate its name because its name itself presupposes that there is something to which it refers that can be defined and has a limit. And therefore, even the term itself, the one or the good, must be abandoned. In that abandonment of that final step, there is an openness and a realization that has no object. And that's where beauty leads to, and that what it is what it culminates in. And from that, the next stage in the metaphysical evolution, as it were, not cosmology, but metaphysics, the good or the one, therefore, is itself a limit of infinite power, since the, in the idea of one, there's a continuation of the idea of ones with great power. On the other hand, there's also great power with various limits, which allows you to say that the universe is capable of multiple levels and multiple levels of significance, because it is an intelligible universe that is disclosed in a vision of beauty, which can only be brought together when one then takes advantage of all of the goodnesses that man can grasp and endure and participate in for his quest to the good itself. So, I was going to read something out of Plotinus. So let me read something out. Platina. This is an old copy. It's one they used to sell them for 50 cents. Um, no, no, no. This is, this is like an old friend, like an old shoe, maybe. All beauty must induce an astonishment, a delicious wonderment, a longing, a love, a trembling that is all delight. It may be felt for things invisible, quite as for the things you see. And indeed, the soul does feel it. All souls, we can say, feel it. All can perceive it. They're all stung sharply by it. But not all can be said to be sharply stung by it. Only those to whom we call lovers. Because would you not agree? I mean, anyone who pursues beauty in itself, by definition, they're lovers. Because that's what love seeks. Uh, let's see. I always have a problem wondering where to read Plotinus. Uh, what sort of realities, beautiful realities, he's talking about revealing beauty, 
But reason wants to know why they make the soul lovable, wants to know what is it, like a light, that shines through all the virtues, through all realities. Um, purified, the soul is holy idea and reason. What is it? What is this vision? What is it like? Let him who can arise, withdraw into himself, forego all that is known by the eyes, turn aside forever from the bodily beauty that once was his joy. It does not hanker after graceful shapes that appear in bodies, but know them for copies, traceries, shadows, and hasten away towards that which they truly bespeak. For if one pursues what is like a beautiful shape, is there not a myth about such a dupe? How we sank into the depths of the current and swept away into nothingness? Let us flee then to the beloved fatherland. I have one quote I want to make sure I read to you. These lovers of beauty, whoever they are, beyond the realm of sense, must be made to declare themselves. What is your experience in beholding beauty in actions, manners, temperance, behavior, in all acts? Uh, what are the beauty in souls? What do you feel when you see that you are yourself all beautiful within? Just what is that intoxication, this exaltation? This longing to break away from the body and live sunken within your souls. All true lovers experience it. But what awakens so much passion? Is it not, it's, it's not the shape or the color or the size. It's the soul. It's self-colorless. So this goes on. And above all, you, I'm putting in the word must, right? And above them all, you see the radiance of the intelligence diffusing itself throughout them all. They're attractive, they're lovable. Why are they said to be beautiful? Because clearly they are beautiful, and anyone that sees them must admit that they are true realities. Reality. Hmm. So, then look here. If you then behold the good, That means then it is in such a way as a object of experience. If it's an object of experience, then you're beholding. So beholding has an object. You're, if you then behold the good, what you experience is beauty. What you discover through the beauty is the nature of your self and reality. That beholding, that beholding, see, that beholding in Greek is an idea to behold. So to behold the good is to, to experience it. To have the good as an object of experience is to then be able to participate in what is called the idea of the good, 
with a capital I. For the very notion of idea, idea, right, is to behold. It's not thinking about the good, it is beholding the good. And when one, one is beholding the good, you can talk about it as an experience. And as an experience, it becomes an object of experience, it is beauty. And as beauty, it is a sufficient testimony that we live, therefore, in an intelligible, meaningful world, which then allows us then to the final quest to take a look at the source of it, and the source of it is the good itself. And I think I've talked enough. How about some questions that we can play? Oh, I have a great quote from Plato. I brought my Plato. I, I have to share this. This is one of my favorite quotes. How does he look at it? Now, Plato's whole game, Plato's whole game, is whatever degree you've experienced beauty, that's what you turn and reflect on, not the object of it, the experience. So reflect, reflect, always reflect on the experience. So much then in honor of memory, on account of which I have now spoken at some length, through yearning for the joys of that other time, but beauty, as I said before, shone in brilliance among those visions, and since we came to earth, we found it shining most clearly through the clearest of our senses. For sight is the sharpest of the physical senses, though wisdom is not seen by it, for wisdom would arouse a terrible love if such a clear image of it were granted as could would come through sight. And the same is true for the other lovely realities, but beauty alone has this privilege, and therefore it is the most clean, clearly seen and the loveliest. And that's the introduction into Plato and Plotinus. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. All right. All right. So, you were speaking earlier about people experiencing beauty and experiencing their most inmost being. And I was wondering um, what relationship that has with uh, energy centers, chakras. Um, you see, the, to endure and experience, to participate on, on, in an experience uh, presupposes some cor some, uh, something that is correlated with it. That is to say, like in bi for every experience, it is said to be a biochemical correlate to it. Right? So that must come from somewhere that has some source, and therefore, there are all kinds of sources or centers for such energy. And therefore, like in Plato, he has uh, uh, a whole exploration of centers. But essentially, uh, the problem with centers is that then you're hooked into exploring or interested in it, into exploring experiences. But the good itself doesn't need centers, because it's not an experience. An experience has a beginning, a middle, and an end. It has its limits, it has its beginning and end, it has its middle. It can have rises and falls, it can be greater and less, even the most profound. Therefore, 
there must be something corresponding to it in the human psyche, in the human system. But the good itself, one itself, no centers, because it's not an experience. But you just said that the way to, that ex to understand the experience of beauty is to reflect on So if you're reflecting on mm -hmm. that experience mm -hmm. that has a beginning and a middle and an end. Yeah, for, yeah, that will get you to this experience. See, for Plato, it's essential to know what separates Plato from, so far as I can see, from other systems, is that he thinks it's essential to experience this and to go beyond it. So the, by reflecting on the experience, then you can go beyond it? it well, no, uh, no, it admits of degrees. Mm -hmm. And that's important to realize. It's important to experience more profound states. Most people start out with just uh, a certain level of experiences of beauty to enhance it, to dwell into it as a training of the mind, and that will bring on higher degrees of experience. That's essential in a Platonic universe. But ultimately the goal is to stop reflecting on the experience not, it, or... Not stopping. Well, okay. Transcending. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You had to step... You to say, well... That's certainly nice, but it ain't going to go where I want to go. And you know, it's a, this is a terrible statement of someone might say, you know, oh darn it, I just had an experience of the nature of ultimate reality. Darn it. See earlier, earlier. <laughs> <laughs> the irony of all possible ironies. <laughs> well, gee, I, I feel sorry for you. <laughs> earlier, you said that. The idea would be to prepare yourself to be receptive and to be in a receptive silence, to allow an anticipation of something good. How is that like the reflect, reflecting on an experience of beauty? It is. That's the way to prepare for the experience of beauty. Is to reflect on what sure. you had. Sure. Yes. 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 Whatever it was you engaged in, whatever it was that you encountered that brought about an experience of beauty, is there any sense in which you could get, you could become more involved in it more profoundly had you done this or that or the other thing? Exactly. That admits then of degrees, you see. So then that is the, what you're talking about is anticipation? Mm -hmm. okay. No. For the good is a jump, there ain't nothing. So you have to encounter an idea of the good before encountering the good itself? Is that true? No. Is it the other way around? <laughs> no. When you're reflecting... Why don't, why don't, why don't, yeah. why don't. Uh, in some systems, like in the Bhagavad Gita, the 11th chapter, the 11th, there's a great experience of the Atman as uh, divine lights, like 10,000 suns, etc., and they consider that as an ultimate experience, you see. Okay, ultimate experience. Nothing beyond it. And for some people who are involved in the system, then they have to go the next step, and they have to therefore get out of this kind of Hinduism to go beyond it. Does it say that in the Gita? Does it say this in the Gita? That, What's the this? Um, that this is the ultimate experience, or ultimate goal? Cosmic vision, like well, that's why, that's why Arjuna was given a, the eye of yoga in order to see the nature of reality. But again, that's an experience. He's, yes. he's beholding. Yes, yeah, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's right. But it doesn't talk about going beyond that in the Gita. Right. In the Gita? Yeah. Well, perhaps you know where. No, no, it doesn't. Oh, right. oh, 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 oh. That is what you said. Well, see, the Gita is only 25 chapters of the Mahabharata. Mm -hmm. And uh, I haven't read the whole Mahabharata, Mahabharata. Maybe it's somewhere else, and if you knew it, I'd look it up. And no, sure. Yeah. So Plato talks about energy centers? Is that what you're saying? That's that's is that what I said? Yeah, that's what I said. Really? <laughs> what, what work is that? Yeah. Like the, the energy? Well, that's the whole, that's the, uh, uh, this is from the Phaedrus. The whole myth in the Phaedrus deals with all of these things that I've just been talking about. This whole construction. 
That's all the fighters. And that admits of various degrees. So I would say, fighters, if that's what you're looking for. Okay. I, I thought I had it understood, but I got confused because I thought that Platonic thought held that you had to encounter an idea of the good before you encountered the good itself. Maybe I'm saying it wrong. What I'm saying is those experiences that have beginning, middles, and ends, ups and downs, and to reflect upon those, not for that itself, but to go one step beyond it to that which has no qualities, yeah, sure. to the good. So then don't you encounter the idea of the good first? I thought your question before was whether or not they could be taken separately. If you're saying that they can be taken sequentially, that's true. That's okay. his goal. Yeah, that's his goal in the Republic is to take it sequentially. There are some systems that have either seldom do they have them both, and when they do have them both, that they don't see that one is the uh, necessarily related to the other. Okay. But, I, but the, what we're saying is that they are essentially related. We are saying that they are essentially related. And they have to be related. They can't have one without. Yes, you can have one without well, you the can other. can have one without the other, but that's not what Plato is saying in the Republic. That's correct. Okay. Right. He talks about people who are experiencing this as people who are like at the Isles of the Blessed, and that's where they stay. And he says they have nothing more to do other than to stay in that state. And he thinks it's therefore important to go beyond it. And the tool to go beyond it, of course, is the dialectic, which is another phase of Platonic thought. Uh, in that sort of triad that you talk about that kind of permeates the whole vision, the being, good, mm -hmm. vitality, mm -hmm. um, that's sort of a metaphysical description of an experience. That's like um, putting, describing an experience. My, mm -hmm. my question mm -hmm. is more with the experience. Mm -hmm. What would Socrates or Plato or anybody be doing most purely and most directly as an activity such that they'd be doing that since I don't think they'd simply be reflecting on the natures. Have to be contemplating. You would, con you, you would be actually contemplating on that triad yeah. and the interrelationship and the <clears throat> doing yeah. what you just did up there on the chalkboard. Yeah. Well, that, That's what you're that, saying that, is required yeah, to, to do that. Yeah. You see, there are many people who have had th this kind of experience we're calling beauty itself, that don't go on and make these distinctions. The value of metaphysics is that it tries, to, it tries to comprehend the nature of the experiences and finding categories in the experience with which then to, to understand it. And there are many people, poets and all the kinds of people, visionaries throughout history that have very splendid visions, very much like beauty itself. Burke. Uh, has, of course, cosmic consciousness, one of the great ones. But they don't, they don't try to then reflect and say, what is it that's so much akin in that experience to myself? It's out of such reflections that you get these categories, and then these categories begin to be the very ideas of metaphysics. See, metaphysics isn't taking a group of ideas and putting them in. It's discovering their necessity through these experiences which then, then can bring about a, a way of understanding them in their totality so that therefore uh, the, this realm is not only intelligible but understandable. That's the goal. So it would be just as important to do this kind of work as to, to seek out those kinds of experiences. I mean, it's kind of, they go hand in hand in this game. Yes, let me, let me even go further. <clears throat> Unless someone went through this kind of analysis, they couldn't do the Platonic dialectic to the good. There's no way they could do it, because the uh, passage from uh, being, or the idea of the good to the good itself, is through a dialectic. And the dialectic means you're going to explore the very assumptions that you make, and that you have made, dealing with the experience of beauty itself or beholding the good. And you can't reach presuppositions or assumptions or hypotheses unless you then find a language to express the content of your experience. 
And therefore, this game is only open to people who want to put words, find the proper words to express their most profound experiences, which then can be used for this higher purpose. And so the good is not inexpressible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No qualities, therefore. Is that by nature simple? Uh, what did you say? Simple, 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 simple. Okay. That's, 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 it is simple, then you got, well, it, it exists and it is simple. Two! <laughs> <laughs> uh, <clears throat> like I'm trying to, when you started out, you said that language is a means by which, or leads to a vision. It can be, depending on the kind of language you use, makes it possible. Is that, is that, am I quoting you or? No, you're not. Okay. Yeah. I'm sorry. Aren't you? Partially. Wasn't that the first thing you Yeah. Did you, do you need it for shapes what you're going to be doing? Shapes. Yeah. Shapes. Okay. Oh. Um, Brains to birth, what was previously in shadows. Yeah. Okay, it's shapes, vision, for seeing. This kind of language. Yeah. Yeah. I was, I was trying to understand how that description that you did of the triad represented that kind of phenomenon, shaping vision for, I mean, mm -hmm. shaping vision for seeing. Am I saying that right? Using words to make the diagram, and, and so it is, that's what mm -hmm. good is, is being, vitality, and then uh, intelligible. And that's using words to create vision in the chalkboard. And it's not there anymore. It's like a butterfly net. <laughs> to describe something. If you don't have the net and the right weave of words, mm -hmm. you're not going to mm -hmm. catch the butterfly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's the anticipation. But actually, because if you can form words to, if you can put words on your experience such that it becomes unintelligible, and that must prepare you to, to have a further experience of it. Well, yes, yeah, since it admits of degrees, that's right. One can enter into this at various depths, under various conditions, more and more profoundly, even though it's one. Then you become a slave to the words. Pardon me? Then you become a slave to the words, like having a great time. Oh, yeah, then. Having a great time. Oh, that's, good. that's quite true. But one of the dangers, of course, is that you may keep, you may keep the language instead of the recollecting the experience. Yeah. Yeah. And that, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Let me tell you what I recall. Uh oh, well, I make sure, try to get back to the experience. Don't tell me those words that have been used so often. Yeah. It's always a danger, isn't it? Yeah. How can you describe the beach? Yeah. But there are some people who can use words. Plotinus, Plato, pretty good, pretty good fun. Oh. Thank, you. Thank you. I enjoyed it. I was looking forward to seeing what I would say. <laughs>